Hello. In the late 80s, there were no smartphones. Console video games were mostly made of just 8 bits, and the internet only existed so that the military could control the flow of information. If you wanted to immerse yourself in an interactive epic fantasy adventure, then your best bet was making some friends and playing D&D. Or if you didn't have any friends and or disliked the company of other humans, then you might pick up a game book and play a solo adventure like the Warlock of Firetop Mountain. At least they were your best bets before 1988, because that's when Steve Jackson created an interactive telephone based game where you could choose your own adventure and the stakes, the immersion and the price per minute were sky high. Just make sure you get to the bill before your mum sees it. I'm Jordan, this is Jordan Sorcery, and we are dialing up adventure because today we're exploring the history of Steve Jackson's fist. What exactly did I just say? Let me spell it out for you. Fantasy interactive scenarios by telephone. And not just anyone's fantasy interactive scenarios by telephone. No, these were the fantasy interactive scenarios by telephone from Steve Jackson, the fantasy gaming impresario who had helped create Games Workshop and Fighting Fantasy. But what exactly is a fantasy interactive scenario by telephone, I hear you ask? Well, this was where your 1980s mind would be blown to smithereens. You could pick up a phone, hear an adventure dialogue, and then choose your own adventure. And it sounded like this. The number you have dialed is not of this earth. You have opened the gateway to an alternative reality, and you are being connected to another world in another time where you are another person. Welcome to the world of Fist! And things only got more intense from there on out. But before we get into the history of Steve Jackson's Fist, let's cover three things quite quickly. One, yes, Fist is the acronym Fantasy Interactive Scenarios by Telephone. Even today, Steve Jackson has said that this is probably not the best name in retrospect. But at the time, maybe it was more innocent. Second, you can subscribe to my channel, you can like this video and you can share it. I would really appreciate it if you did. And third, who is Steve Jackson? Well, he was the creator of Fighting Fantasy with Sir Ian Livingston and one of the co-founders of Games Workshop. After creating Games Workshop in 1975 with Livingston and their friend John Peake, Steve Jackson would spend the first few years of the company helping to build it into a retail chain and game publisher. And then in the early 80s, again with Livingston, Jackson would co-create Fighting Fantasy, the game book series that started with The Warlock of Firetop Mountain. Those game books were almost like solo role-playing adventures where you rolled up stats, read a section of the book's story, and then were presented with options on what you you wanted to do next. Based on your decision, you would turn to a specific page and find out what was going to happen to you. And that was a template that would serve Jackson well when it came to creating Fist. But I should add for clarity that there was another Steve Jackson who was also operating in the tabletop game industry throughout this entire period as well. He was born in the US and he founded his own company called Steve Jackson Games. Where it gets super confusing though is that the US Steve Jackson actually wrote some fighting fantasy stories for the UK Steve Jackson. So I guess they enjoyed sowing confusion across the tabletop gaming industry. As fighting fantasy had become increasingly popular through the 80s, Steve Jackson had stepped away from managing Games Workshop and focused on writing game books like Starship Traveler, House of Hell, and his Sorcery series. And he was also working on a gaming and puzzle section for the Daily Telegraph. And that was when a company called Computer Dial reached out to him. 
So we're all geared up for this uh, number 26 on uh, was going to be fist. Well, it was going to be something. It was just going to be called. Um, and, and I took it over as a project uh, and suddenly realized that you, you can't do it like this. You can't um, have, you know, two minutes of speech and then uh, and then make a decision and then another three minutes of speech. Because I mean, apart from anything else, people were paying by the, by the um, minute. Computer Dial had licensed the technology from a Californian company that could read the clicks on rotary dial phones. And it also worked for the tone dial phones that were just starting at the time. This sounds incredibly retro and old hat now because it is. But at the time, Computer Dial's technology was amazing. They could understand what you were keying into your phone whilst you were on the call, which meant that they could play you some dialogue you could key in a number and then they could respond to what you had keyed in. It was perfect for bringing things like fighting fantasy game books to life. And that is why they wanted Steve Jackson to be involved. Up to this point, Computer Dial had been using the technology primarily to allow astrologer Russell Grant to share horoscopes after a caller would dial in their date of birth. Steve Jackson felt that the technology offered so much more potential though. It was like someone had said to me, hey, we've just invented a pack of cards. We've been using it to tell fortunes. Want to see if you can invent any games to play with them? Jackson went on to describe the process for composing the first Fist adventure as something between writing a game book and creating computer code. And for that first adventure, the story would be the stuff of classic fantasy. It was about the lair of a demon prince called the Castle Mammon. The demon prince Cadis Ra built his empire in the vast dungeons of the Castle Mammon. For years, he has lured warriors into his underworld, tempting them with the chance for fame and fortune. Hidden riches await those who have the skill and strength to overcome Cadis Ra's undead legions. But beware, many brave adventurers have entered this evil labyrinth and few have escaped. In order to advertise this game and later Fist adventures, Steve Jackson would enlist artists responsible for amazing fighting fantasy and Games Workshop art like Martin McKenna, John Blanche and Chris Achilleos. They created atmospheric adverts that could be seen in magazines like White Dwarf and newspapers like The Mirror and The Sun. The number has long since been disconnected, no matter how many times I try calling it. But back in 1988, it was receiving over a thousand calls a day. And then when the newspaper adverts hit, that number skyrocketed to over 5,000. When the game launched in the US, it was charged at $1.45 for the first minute and then 45 cents for every minute thereafter. And in the UK, it would cost you 25 pence in the evening and 38 pence per minute during the day. So, it should probably come as no surprise that in 1998, in an interview with IGN, Steve Jackson confessed that with just the proceeds from Fist alone, he was able to buy a villa in Spain. Casa Mamon, indeed. If you yourself were super invested in Fist, you could send a self-addressed envelope to Computer Dial in order to receive an adventurous pack featuring more lore and information on the game and the story. The Computer Dial system would let you save your progress for up to four weeks, which, as I understand it, means that when you got to a certain point, you could request a code, and that code would let you dial back into that point in the adventure next time you called up. The recording process for the first Fist adventure took about a week, with about five hours of final recording captured in about 600 audio files. And the narration was provided by actor Anthony Jackson, who, as I understand it, is no relation to Steve Jackson. As well as appearing in a ton of British TV over the years, Anthony Jackson was perhaps most famous for his performance as the tale bearer in a BBC radio adaptation of The Hobbit in 1968. The tale bearer being a character who was introduced to narrate the story. Anthony Jackson's work on Fist is genuinely amazing. It brings an energy and electricity to the performance, which along with the sound effects is just 
perfectly atmospheric. I mean, listen to this. Nightfall is approaching rapidly as you reach the deserted castle. The main entrance gate is unattended and ajar, creaking in the wind. Storm clouds are gathering on the horizon, but you have reached your destination after a full day's ride, and now is not the time for turning back. You dismount from your horse and enter through the castle gate. Inside is an empty courtyard. The gate has slammed shut behind you and is firmly locked. Who is this who dares enter the domain of Cadiz Ra? A Guardian article actually quoted Steve Jackson in reference to how he created the sound effects for the story. I'd heard that what you do is chop a cabbage, and that sounds like chopping somebody's head off. So we had it all mic'd up in the studio, and I got a sword, and then bought this cabbage from a greengrocer. And I got the sword, and I swung it, and it went pfft. So we went through all the vegetables, all the different things we could find in the studio. And the one we came across in the end was a bricklayer's trowel with a cabbage. The cabbage was still good. You stuck the trowel in and twisted it, and there was all this popping noise. And Tony Jackson got right into it, got a glass of water, and created a gurgling noise for about 20 seconds. It was fantastic. Besides the adventure gameplay, there was another feature, the Black Crow Tavern, which would allow multiple callers to be on the line together at the same time. They could share stories, talk about hints and tips, and really just have that feeling of being in the same place together. It was the original fantasy party line. From the far side of the courtyard, a horse is charging towards you. You recognize it as your own horse, which you left tied up outside the castle. A black cloaked figure stands in the saddle, whipping your horse into a frenzy with its sword. Blood is dripping from its haunches. As it gets closer, you can see the figure more clearly. The billowing cloak obscures its body, but the hood falls from its head to reveal nothing. You must draw your sword quickly to battle the headless horseman. If you bested the challenge of Castle Mamon and escaped the clutches of Cadiz Ra, then you could be in with the chance of winning some real physical rewards. Every single month, there were prize draws for the top scoring treasure looters. Runners up would get t shirts emblazoned with the logo Steve Jackson's Fist, and the top four scorers would get actual pieces of gold. Now, I <laughs> would love to know exactly how much gold we're talking about. I'm assuming it's not a lot of gold. I guess it's a small amount of gold. But whatever it was, it seemed worth the challenge because it was so popular. Computer Dial and Steve Jackson did incredibly well from these games. And that is why Computer Dial wanted a sequel from Steve Jackson, which he was very pleased to create. I did the first one. And wasn't sure how it was going to work at all and it turned out to be a great success and I, I was happened to be living in Spain at the time and I remember my mother uh, phoning me up and saying oh we just had the first royalty check in and it was it was it was an awful lot <laughs> she was very chuffed with that and finally something finally I was doing something that she approved of <laughs> The Rings of Alion was the second fist scenario, and it was a direct sequel to Castle Mamon, with the action taking place in an as yet unexplored part of the same location. Whilst having a well earned drink in the Black Claw Tavern, you were interrupted by the wizard Alion, bursting in, seeking help. His five rings have been stolen by Cadiz Ra's minions and taken into the darkness beneath the castle. Adventure 2 launched in March 1989. Technical innovations and user feedback from the first Fist meant that there were improvements made to the service as a whole. It was now possible to register your score without having to actually escape the dungeon. And something called macro steps were introduced that let callers skip through expositionary sequences. Plus, there were so called big bangs that would affect the dungeon sequencing. They would actually change the order and option numbers of the dungeon meaning that players who called back at different times would experience a different dungeon scenario. And seemingly in response to the compulsive nature of the first game, there were some controls introduced to reduce the total session time 
for some players, meaning that they didn't spend too long in one go. Something called the Death Watch Patrol would enter the dungeon at specific times in the day, and you would have to dial off and take a rest. There was more amazing art created to advertise Fist, with some work by John Blanche and Chris Achilleos used in various ways. And having proved the viability of the technology for fantasy adventures, Computer Dial were not the only company looking for sequels, spin offs, and follow ups. There were plenty more in this new telephone based gold rush. Joe Diva, the former Games Workshop staffer who had created the Lone Wolf series of game books with Gary Chalk, took his franchise to the audio dimension with a series of telephone adventures called Lone Wolf Phone Quest. They started with the Forbidden Tower and they continued with the Fortress of Doom. Steve Jackson's fighting fantasy co creator Ian Livingston was also keen to try his hand at the interactive audio adventure with his War of Wizards, the telephone game of spell combat. Livingston's adventure was placed firmly within the world of fighting fantasy and featured the tower of the wizard Yastromo, and the villain was the evil Zagor who originated with the warlock of Firetop Mountain. Jackson himself would return to Computer Dial to experiment with settings and stories beyond those of the traditional fantasy ones he'd already done. Steve Jackson's Gladiators of the Roman Empire provided an experience that was exactly what it sounded like. You got to play as a gladiator in the arenas of the Roman Empire, and it seemed to feature player versus player combat as well. And then Jackson returned to the fantasy genre with a darker adventure that may or may not have been the third part of the Fist story. I can't quite confirm it. But what we do know was that it was called The Slaughterhouse. This adventure was described as a masterpiece of the macabre and featured a suitably terrifying advert. The game had a range of new innovations, including a choice of character types. You could play a hero, a thief, or a guard. It was time sensitive, and players were attempting to escape as quickly as possible. Plus, those players could interact and provide each other with clues. Or you could arrest or kill players if you thought that their character type posed a danger to you. Though the Fist games were incredibly successful, they appear to have come to an untimely end. According to Steve Jackson, the company that ran them, Computer Dial, was acquired by Ladbrokes, the betting company. And they weren't interested in using the technology for a fantasy adventure game. They had something far more lucrative in mind. Gambling. Fist was shuttered in the early 90s, and Steve Jackson retained the original audio recordings. With the exception of the odd documentary There and Here, we've not been able to listen to much of the actual adventure for about 30 years. At least until now. In December of 2023, audio gaming company Sound Realms announced that they would be releasing Fist the Return. With Steve Jackson's help, Sound Realms has digitized the Castle Mammon, allowing for the interactive adventure to be played on modern devices. I've actually asked Sound Realms when we can expect the game to be available, and so far there's no confirmed date, but it does sound like it's not too far off. Having missed Castle Mammon first time around, I've got to say that I am genuinely really excited to play this. Not least because I really want to know what happens after you hear this. Before you can draw your sword, a hand has fastened itself around your wrist. The figure on the altar sits upright, and the sheet slides from its body to reveal the grotesque head of a brimstone demon in human form. You must fight it without your sword. Anthony Jackson is awesome. I cannot wait to listen to and experience Castle Mammon for real. Genuinely, I am really super, super excited, and it's been great to immerse myself in that history and to hear some snippets of it whilst making this video. So I really want to thank Steve Jackson and Oscar Carlquist of Sound Realms for providing me with some of the audio from Fist and for answering my very many, no doubt, super irritating questions about the amazing game experience. I hope that you have enjoyed it. And if you want to support my work here on the channel, please consider checking out my Patreon via the link in the description below. 
And if you can like and subscribe and share any of my videos, including this one, I would really, really appreciate it. It helps me so, so much. Thank you for watching. I'm Jordan, and this is Jordan Sorcery. Is there a market for Martha's Paw? P A W. Plundering Animal Warriors. It's basically about looting dreamies.